Hi, hello, welcome to Physionic, or welcome back to a Physionic detailed study analysis. Uh, today, we're going to be going over some, it's going to be a pretty short, uh, detailed study analysis, uh, mainly because there's only going to be one, or well, I guess two pieces of data that I'm going to be showing you, but they're all going to be on one slide. Uh, so it should be relatively simple and, and straightforward to get through. Uh, what we're going to be investigating today is going to be related to trying to answer the question of how a high total fat plus high saturated fat diet compares to a low fat, low saturated fat diet. So two, two different variables are being changed essentially. Uh, so we're not going to be able to answer if saturated fat has a negative effect or a positive effect. Uh, we're only going to be able to make our, our conclusions based off of both, so high fat and high saturated fat. So if you consume a high fat, high saturated fat diet, or if you consume a low fat, low saturated fat diet, then uh, this video is for you. Uh, mainly because we're going to be looking at insulin sensitivity. So we're going to be looking at a variety of different measures on insulin sensitivity in uh, human beings. So this is a, a human clinical, clinical trial. With that kind of introduction on the study out of the way, if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is uh, Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine. Uh, I hold my master's in exercise physiology, and I've been a cell bio in cell biology laboratories uh, for almost 10 years now at this point, which is kind of remarkable to think about. I guess it's been, what, like eight or nine years at this point. So it's been a while. Uh, but with those credentials out of the way and a bit of an introduction on what we're actually going to be discussing, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the study, shall we? Okay, so the question, as I mentioned, that we're going to be examining a uh, big picture is how does a high fat, high saturated fat diet compare against a low fat diet, which is also low in saturated fat, on measures of insulin sensitivity? Uh, and this information that we're going to be gaining is going to come from a study called a high fat, high saturated fat diet decreases insulin sensitivity without changing intra-abdominal fat in weight stable, overweight, and obese adults. Uh, this particular conclusion is not necessarily one that I would feel strongly about based off of the data that I have seen uh, from this study, and I'll explain why as we get uh, further into it. But uh, to give you a bit of background, on how they went about this study. They recruited 13 men and women that were overweight. Uh, their mean age or their average age was 36 years. And uh, they did this, this study pretty well. I, I really liked uh, how they designed it. Uh, and I'll explain exactly why. So they had a control diet. They had a low fat diet, obviously, and they had a high fat diet. Um, they put all 13, this is a crossover design experiment, so meaning that uh, everyone that's on the low-fat diet, so if they get randomized or put into the low-fat diet, they will eventually also experience the high-fat diet. So the comparisons are against themselves. So the comparison is uh, each person on the low-fat diet versus themselves on the high-fat diet. But the way that they constructed it, so that's one benefit. It's crossover design, really cool uh, to, to see that so you can compare against yourself. But the other aspect is that they uh, employed a control diet to start out. So kind of a baseline diet to make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of how their physiology is working based off of a particular diet. So they were given a control diet which consisted of 35% fat, 12% of which was saturated fat, 47% carbohydrates, and 18% protein. And they ended up clamping protein levels uh, across all three diets. So they were on this control diet for 10 days to get them all on the same page. And then from there, they were randomized into the low-fat diet or the high-fat diet. So uh, ultimately, this led to people on the low-fat diet consuming at 20% fat, which is pretty low, 8% uh, saturated, which is definitely low, 
and 62% carbohydrates. Obviously, they had to make up for that uh, lack of fat by increasing carbohydrate consumption. And then, like I said, they clamp protein. And the high fat, the people that were on the high fat diet consumed 55% fat, so considerably higher than the control diet or especially the low fat diet. It's not ketogenic or anything like that, but it's certainly much higher. And 25% saturated fat. And this is really interesting to me because a lot of studies, uh, they use like 17% saturated fat. Um, some studies show some differences with 17%. Some people, some studies don't. Uh, but I think universally when uh, when the, the studies I've looked at so far that have looked at uh, differential effects with saturated fat have shown that uh, anything above like 20, but definitely 25, 30% saturated fat, you definitely start seeing some differences in, in the effects. So it's cool that they, they had a, a pretty high uh, increase in saturated fat, which goes in line with the high fat, high saturated fat uh, aspect of this diet. Then, of course, they had to reduce their carbohydrates at 27% and then 18% protein. So if they were put on, let's say, it doesn't matter. I just put these in line, but oh, it could have been the high fat first and the low fat afterwards. But they were on the low fat diet for four weeks. Then they had a wash up period where they returned home, just ate how they normally eat. And then uh, they would come back into the laboratory and were instructed with the, uh, with the instruction of dietitians and whatnot. Uh, and told like how to eat, what to eat, and things like that uh, to consume the control diet again for the 10 days to bring them back down to a, a, a baseline across the, across the board. And then, uh, the high f- and then they were put on the opposite diet, so the high-fat diet in this situation uh, for another four weeks. Uh, obviously, there's always critiques, right? Like you can always say that, oh, they should have been on each diet for longer. And I think in this situation, maybe that is the case. Uh, but in terms of the positives, uh, everything was weight maintained. So dietitians would check uh, their their weight continuously, I think a few times a week, to make sure that they, they were maintaining their weight. So uh, they were eucaloric in terms of everybody was maintaining their caloric intake. Now, in terms of what made up this saturated fat, I know a lot of people like to ask me, okay, well, what kind of saturated fat was it? Uh, it was from butter, so which makes up what like from butter that's like 30%, something like that, from palmitate, which is the fat that I've been focused on so far in my investigations, but certainly I'll be looking at others like stearate as well, um, which stearate is also part of this uh, butter-induced uh, saturated fat composition, but also uh, short-chain fatty acids, which are much smaller Uh, fats like uh, butyrate, for example. But ultimately, in big picture, just know that this is the high fat, high total fat plus high saturated fat versus low fat, low saturated fat. It isn't as much of a delta, as much of a decrease from 12% saturated fat to 8% compared to 12% to 25%. So that may play a factor, but ultimately there's only so many variables that you can change at once in one study. Okay. So there's our background. Uh, Hopefully you were able to follow along with that. If not, then uh, feel free to ask questions and I'll I'll try to answer them as best as I can. Or you can check out the the study notes that I have attached for you. Okay, now I get, let me remove myself here. Uh, I get that this looks overwhelming. Don't worry, it's not. uh, Well, (laughs) not that I want to invalidate how you feel. Yeah, let me just say that uh, it's going to be really simple to, to, to walk through, and I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, so here is, so this data was actually shown in the paper before this data, but ultimately, even though the paper came out in 2010, I want to say, which is uh, pretty recent to this recording, I mean, just within the last 12 years, um, I hated these graphs. I absolutely despised them. Uh, I was stunned at how poorly they decided to, to, to create these graphs because they're just so confusing. Uh, I mean, they're easy to read in terms of just on the face of it, but like trying to distinguish which one is uh, one condition compared to another condition was really difficult. So I ended up uh, look, relying more on the table, which actually gives you the values which uh, fit into this scenario right here. So we'll, we'll get to this, but for now, let me explain the table. So we've got our individuals for uh, each condition, uh, 
according to their measures and we've got their low fat so we've got the low fat diet and that versus like the high fat diet and we've got our control so before they were on their respective diet so on the low fat diet or the high fat diet and then after they were after the four weeks of being on the low fat or the high fat diet. And this is the overall change between, so if we just focus on this quadrant right here, we're focusing on low fat diet. So the difference between the control diet, the measures in the control diet versus the measures in the low fat diet after four weeks. And this is the change between comparing these two. The same thing applies for the high fat diet. And then they show the difference the comparison between the low fat diet and the high fat diet so essentially this change versus this change so this is a within treatments comparison so within a particular treatment so right low fat diet compared to control and then the comparison of the low fat versus the high fat is called the between treatments uh, condition now Ultimately, just all you need to know is that we're comparing two different things. We're comparing each diet versus the control and then each diet against each other, okay? And I've denoted here where there are actual changes. So I'm gonna walk you through some of these. So like uh, fasting glucose was not different with the low fat diet or with the high fat diet. Uh, plasma insulin or fasting insulin was also not different according to uh, this data for the low fat or the high fat. But here's where we start getting some differences and these two actually correspond to, to these measures right here. So RD is a uh, glucose disposal. So you have uh, a certain amount of sh blood sugar that's found in your system and they're measuring at a low insulin concentration how much blood sugar is removed from the bloodstream into the tissues. So that's what this RD low implies. And that's what we find uh, here, right? So we've got our low fat diet. This is the RD low, and this is the RD low for the high fat diet. And what we're measuring, what we're showing, and this is not evident at all, and this is why I really hated this, is the shift in this RD or the glucose disposal uh, with each diet. So clearly with this, the, the lines are overlapping. So there's no shift. There's no change. And if we look here, the low fat diet, what we find, we find that there's no change. Sure. You can look at these numbers and say, okay, 1.77 compared to 1.84 clearly is a change, but statistically speaking, there's no change. Uh, so what we do here is compare the, the average right here. So 1.77 versus 1.84. And if it has a one, attributed to it, that means that there is a difference versus the control. So this would be different against this, but there is no one. So there's no statistical difference. On the other hand, if we look at the high fat diet, we do see that there's a difference. So there's a one. So yes, this decrease from 1.99 to 1.56 is enough of a difference to show that there's a difference between these two. But beyond that, the two is versus the other diet. So this is a comparison against the low fat diet and we see that there's also a difference between those two so within treatments and between treatments there is a difference with the high fat diet and we see that reflected in a shift in the rd at the low value but also at the high value so if we look at the high value 5.48 to 5.64 even though there's you can see that the numbers are different statistically speaking there is no difference so mathematically, there is no difference. However, again, if we focus in on this RD high, so again, these are measures up here with high insulin, when insulin levels are higher, do we see similar disposal of glucose or blood sugar levels? And we find that with the high fat diet, there is a shift just like with the uh, low insulin condition with the high insulin condition. So you're increasing insulin levels here. This is blood glucose levels being uh, sequestered or, or, or taken up by the tissues. And we see that there's a shift from this is before the, this is on the control diet. And then this is with after the high fat diet. So this is a shift downwards. So with more insulin, 
there's a less glucose, less blood sugar that's being removed into the peripheral tissues. And we see that confirmed here by the numbers. So 5.79 compared to 5.11. Interestingly here, we only see uh, a difference between the, the control and the high fat diet. We don't see that compared against the low fat diet. So there's no statistical difference in that regard. Uh, here we've got other measures of insulin response. So the acute, so a, a kind of a quick snapshot of an insulin response, acute insulin response, uh, there's no difference. Again, you see these differences. You, you see the numbers change, but statistically speaking, there's no difference. And kg is another uh, way of looking at this glucose disposal. So kg is the glucose kinetics, I think. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Glucose kinetics, and here we see that the disposal rate is increased. So the ability for the cells to take up glucose is increased from 1.82 to 2.33% per minute. Um, and again, here we see that there's a st statistical difference between the, the two. However, we don't see that when we compare the high fat diet versus the control, but ultimately there's still a difference. And then we've got a bunch of other measures for insulin sensitivity. None of these end up changing for high fat or for the low fat diet. But if we look at liver fat percentage, we see that there is a decrease in liver fat uh, just compared to the control. However, we don't see that if we compare the low fat versus high fat. So no difference there. And then I wanted to point out this uh, non-difference. This is a um, intra-abdominal fat. So this is the fat, the visceral fat that's found around your organs. And here we see that there's no difference, again, for, for either one of these conditions. Again, this one looks like it's decreasing. This one looks like it's increasing, but no difference. And the final actual difference is the sub subcutaneous fat. And I found this actually really fascinating because, uh, you know, it's just one study, but this is pretty cool to keep in mind these individuals didn't lose or gain weight. Right here we see their weight, so 100.7 to 100 100.5 uh, kilograms. Again, non-statistically significant difference with uh, quite, a, quite a, a, a relatively tight uh, error bar. And here again, we see that there's, you know, it's a 0.1 difference. So there's not going to be much uh, there for, for it to be statistically significant. So the weight didn't change. And yet the low fat versus control did not see a, a difference. But the high fat condition saw a statistically significant increase in body fat. So to clarify this, let me cut to me for a second. To clarify that, I'm not saying that a person is gaining body fat uh, from, from without gaining weight. What I'm saying here is that there seems to be some sort of redistribution of the fat. So whatever fat is, is, is they're consuming and whatnot is being preferentially shuttled to right below the skin. So when you think of a person having like abs showing and stuff, that's subcutaneous fat. That's the fat that's right under the skin, as opposed to the visceral, which is the stuff you don't see, which is around your organ systems. So what we see here is that there is an increase in subcutaneous fat specifically. Now, between those two, if you were to, to speak to, to the difference between those two, usually in terms of a health perspective, this one is more important. And we, what we see is that there's no difference. So I, I, I'm just going to leave this as this is interesting data. And it's certainly something that we would have to investigate further with, with other studies. So I'm going to round that out uh, again in, in, in just a little bit when we get into the conclusions. But I wanted to discuss some of the uh, mechanisms that the researchers point out. So there's two mechanisms that are pointed out. So keep in mind that what they mention is that uh, the high fat, high saturated fat diet induces insulin resistance. I'm a little bit more tempered with my, with my conclusion but let's just go forward with their assumption until we get to my conclusion or our conclusion. And certainly if you disagree, you know, post below, I'll be interested, but you know, have some, some reasoning behind it as well. Okay. So saturated fat, which comes in a, a linear form, this is kind of just a basic diagram of what saturated fat looks like, can be incorporated into the cell membrane and the cell membrane then becomes less fluid. 
The problem with that, when a, a membrane becomes less, has less ability to shift and to, to change shape and whatnot and becomes more rigid where you don't have as much movement is that these proteins that are embedded within the cell membrane, like the insulin receptor, the insulin receptor is a, how do I say this? It's a dual protein. So it's two proteins. You can see them slightly different colors. So there's a kind of a lighter blue here and a darker blue here. And what happens, let me cut to, to, to me real quick. What happens is normally the insulin receptor is separated. Now, as it's activated, the insulin receptor will come together and create this dimer, what's known as a dimer, where you have both proteins combine and actually form the complete insulin receptor, which is what we see here. Now, this is what has to happen. You have to have a dimerization of the two proteins for the insulin molecule to then bind and for this to then send a signal inside of the cell, muscle cell, whatever cell you're talking about. And that would normally activate these insulin signaling proteins. There's a bunch of insulin signaling proteins. If you've been following Physionic for a while, you know what some of them are. You know AS160, AKT, IRS, those different proteins. So those will become activated to a point where you get this insulin signaling that allows blood sugar into the cell. That's how the normal insulin cascade would work. However, if saturated fats become a dominant part, not that they can't be any part, but a dominant part of the cell membrane, what happens is the cell membrane becomes more rigid, which means that there are fewer opportunities for those insulin receptors to combine together. That's a problem because then you have less insulin molecules that can then enact what they're supposed to be enacting, insulin sensitivity, by activating these insulin signaling proteins. So that's one mechanism that they postulate that saturated fats have these negative effects. The second mechanism is something that I've also discussed here in Physionic, is the generation of ceramides. There's an enzyme that is known as uh, ceramide synthase, which will take saturated fats and combine them with another molecule known as a sphingosine and generate what are known as ceramides. These ceramides can have a negative effect on insulin signaling proteins in that they will attach to the signaling proteins and inhibit their ability to function normally. Now, ceramides by themselves are not necessarily a negative thing. Uh, but having too many ceramides is a negative thing in that they start to falsely interact with these insulin signaling proteins. So these are the two mechanisms that uh, the, the researchers of this uh, study kind of postulated. This is based off of other research, not anything that we've seen uh, in the research that we've, that we've just looked at. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, a high fat, high saturated fat diet has weak evidence. The reason why I say weak evidence is, let me go back here real quick, is that AIR does not change. Fasting insulin does not change. Fasting glucose, which that one's not as big a deal, but the fasting insulin doesn't change. The basal uh, uh, glucose production, endogenous glucose production doesn't change. Another indication of insulin sensitivity has not changed. There, I mean, sure, you see like, for example, this, this pretty substantial decrease here. So I don't know if it's maybe potentially getting close to, to, to uh, statistically significantly different, but for, for the time being, I can't say that. I can't say, oh yes, there is a difference because it looks like there's a difference. That's not fair. That's not, that's not a, an intellectually honest way of going about this. So all I can say is that there's weak evidence and the weak evidence comes from the reduced glucose disposal uh, that we saw earlier showing reduced glucose clearance. So that's what I mentioned. A low fat, low saturated fat diet does not impact blood sugar clearance. As we saw, the lines were right on top of one another uh, with the low insulin exposure or the high insulin exposure. And secondly, a high fat, this is something I just wanted to add because I thought it was really interesting. Secondly, a high fat, high saturated fat diet increases subcutaneous fat. And let me be very clear here.
I can already tell people are going to say, well, I lost a bunch of weight because I was on a high fat diet. High fat diet works for me. And I'm not denying that. Like there's, I have plenty of studies that show that yes, a high fat diet is undeniably great for weight loss. But this study was specifically designed so that both results are independent of weight, as in their weight did not change. They were specifically instructed not to lose weight. So they were instructed to maintain their weight and with a high fat, high saturated fat diet, they saw increases in subcutaneous fat. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Uh, if you'd like some, uh, this is not an indication of saturated fat specifically, because as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, that if you have an increase in high f in f total fat and an increase in saturated fat, you can't then blame saturated fat specifically because we don't know. But if we were to lump the two together, if your diet is high in fat and high in saturated fat, after four weeks, this would imply that you might start, you might start experiencing some negative effects on insulin sensitivity. But if this ends up like getting worse or getting better, I don't think it's going to get better. But if it gets worse uh, over the next six months or so, that's something that another study would have to investigate. So that's one shortcoming of this study in that uh, they don't look at anything longer than four weeks. But if you're a person who consumes a low fat with low saturated fat, not to say low fat just in general, uh, or low saturated fat in general, but both in combination, then that would imply that you probably don't have to worry about your insulin sensitivity. Again, in the context that you're not gaining weight, that is important as well. So if you're gaining weight, all bets are off. That can change the whole dynamic of what we just went over. Okay, so hopefully you got something out of this. If you'd like to know more information on how saturated fats and unsaturated fats and maybe high carbohydrate diets, low fat diets uh, have what impact they have on, on health, uh, insulin sensitivity specifically, and I would highly recommend that you uh, check out the next videos, the videos that I have linked for you. And with that, I'll hope to speak with you in the near future. Have a good one. Bye.